although Denmark has lots of topographical data available, we are often in a situation where we need to create our own data uh, because we're talking about so how something can be transformed, transformed through planning. So where do we want to change the traffic lines or where do we want to include new urban furniture or perhaps because we just need to depict something that is not on an existing topographical map and we therefore have to create our own data. If we remember back to another video where we talked about how geodata is represented, we remember that there are two types of data, there are raster data and there's vector data and that the way that we represent reality or our world of discourse, we do it by splitting the world into layers and then each of these layers has some spatial data and some attribute data describing it. Exactly which layers you'll need in order to represent a world of discourse is a somewhat design feature. We can, um, if we looked at uh, the Danish topographical maps, we have both layers, uh, the vector data set, we have both layers of motor roads and secondary roads, but we also have one that is called uh, road lines. Road lines has an attribute that distinguishes the roads between different types. So the same data set can be represented so in two ways. We would have a layer for all the secondary roads, a layer for all the primary roads or a layer for all the motor roads, or we could have one layer for all the roads with an attribute that distinguishes between the secondary, the primary and the motor roads. So there are some design pro some aspects you have to consider. Um, typically, if things are the same, so roads, if you have this concept of roads, it might be best to use a one layer to have all the elements of the same type in it. Um, of course, if you are going to register different attributes, um, so you have um, public buildings, um, but for some of those public buildings that are libraries, you're going to register information about how many books, which types of books they have. In that case, the libraries will have different attributes than the other public buildings, and therefore they cannot be in the same layer because things that go in the same layer, they will have to have the same type of geometry, or at least that's in when using the type of data that you'll be using. They'll have to have the same type of geometry, so points, lines, or polygons, and they'll have to have the same attributes. So if we can't have some having opening time and some are having number of books. We will have to have the same attributes for all the elements in the layer. We can of course have different attribute values, so each library have a different amount of books present, but we will have to have a attribute saying number of books for all of the elements in that layer. So there is some considerations about when to split things into different layers and when to have them as a single layer but with an attribute that distinguishes between them. And that via the first thing you should do if you're going to create your own data is you're going to plan it. You're going to sit down and think carefully through what you need. So which type of geometry is it? Points, lines or polygons? Which attributes do you want? Um, number of books, categories, which type of service, whatever, and what type, data type they are of. Um, if you're going to use shape files, you can have texts, integers, decimal values, and dates. Um, you can store them in different ways. You can store them as shape files. You can store them as what's called spatialite databases, or you can store them on a server-based database. They have different properties. Um, shapefiles are the good old trusty workhorse of geodata. Um, 
but they have quite a lot of limitations to what they can do. Spatial light databases is much more advanced, you can do more interesting things, but personally I'm not so happy about them because you can't delete attributes. If you have created an attribute, you're stuck with it. There's no real easy way of getting rid of them. There's odds and ends, but you know, it's not really uh, a good approach. And then we have server-based databases where we can save our data on a server. And then that means that we can only access it when we have access to that central server. We can't bring it on our laptop out into the field. So all of these different data types have different properties that we have to consider. Um, but for most situations, I would recommend you use in QGIS, use shapefiles as the data format you're using. These considerations about data types, attributes, geometries, things are, are best on on a piece of paper. Try and think it through before you start working with the software. It's also be said that if, um, if this data, the data that you create is going to be used for any amount of time, so two years, whatever, or by more than one person, it's very important that you write down what we call the ontology, the definition of what's there. Um, what is a forest? What is a public building? How do we dist distinguish a library from a town hall? All of these things. They are not as such part of the data, but they are the ontology behind the data. It was just, hey, there was an accident in Aarhus Harbour. I'll just indicate the location of the accident. Well, you probably don't need to create an ontology and write about it. But if you're going to have your mapping of public buildings, you need to distinguish public from private. You need to distinguish a building. You need to, to say what, what happens if there's something on first floor and something else on second floor. And they have all of these rules explicitly written down. And trust me, if you don't do it, someone will misunderstand what's happening. Um, because these ontologies are not necessarily um, obvious. In Denmark, for instance, there's um, nothing about if an area is a wood on a marked as woodland, it does not necessarily have to contain trees. Because, well, if there will be planted trees at a later point, well, that's still woodland. So, make sure that you are being, have an explicit ontology if you're going to you share the data between different people or that you're going to use it for more than just a very short while. Once you've done all of this, you can go into QGIS and you can create yourself a new shape layer. So you go up under layers. You choose create layer and shape file layer. That will give you an ability to fill in some X information. It will ask you what type of geometry do you have, points, lines, or polygons. You can choose a character encoding, which of course is very important if you have Danish characters, how they are encoded. I personally prefer using UTF-8. And you can choose a coordinate system. In Denmark, we is use this EPSG 25832 which is also the same as 3044. <clears throat> There's some slight differences and not in the code what you get and the map you get but um, if you're going to transfer the data to a another GIS system such as ArcMap you'll um, find that um, using 3034 gives you a better chance of the data being read properly in ArcMap without any error. So, so if you are in QGIS, uh, I have loaded an aerial photograph of um, Copenhagen, um, this file here, and um, I want to create a new data layer 
showing important boats. I have um, located here, if we zoom in, so here we have the Royal York Dannebrog um, here, and we have a historic military boat here. Um, then I want to create, so I want to add these important boats to the topographical data set. So, and I'm using this typical situation where we have an aerial photograph as our background. So we have that as our input for our data. And I go into layers and say new shape file. I choose UCF8. I choose a polygon. And I choose my coordinate system, uh, this one, or my. Uh, this one, which is a 34, 44, doesn't really matter um, which one I choose. And then I'm ready to start on the next part of it. In the next part of the dialog box, we are able to create the attributes we need. So for each attribute we need, we'll give it a name and we'll choose a data type. Um, and a width, and if it's a decimal number, we'll also have to give it its position. If you're using something else than a shape file, you will have some different attribute types to choose from. So, the process is going in here, giving it a name. So, I'll give it the name of the yacht, call it name, uh, and yeah, 80 characters wide, so that's. You see here it's a text, so and 80 characters, I don't think there's any of those books that have names longer than 80 characters, so I'll say add. And I could give it the number of cannons, uh, and that's going to be a whole number, and we probably don't need more than, I don't think there's more than a, um, 999 cannons on any of these boats so I'll add that information also and we might have a depth so our displacement of the boat uh, decimal values and we will give them none of them more than uh, 99 meters and we just give them a position of one so we can give it as 10 centimeter intervals so, we have now created the different attributes we need for describing the important yachts uh, on this map. So I say OK. And I can now si save my data. Yeah, let's do it down here. Uh, yacht. Um, so, um, we have created our data set. And if we look in our layers, we have our <laughs> uh, strangest built yachts here. 